Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening for our first virtual webinar about recreational scalloping in Hernando, Citrus, and Levy counties. My name is Brittany Hall Sharp, and I'm the Florida Sea Grant agent with UFIFAS Extension in Hernando County. And we have a great lineup tonight covering an array of topics about our Florida Bay scallop. To kick off our webinar, we will have Dr. Graneman with FWC give us an update about the scallop fishery. And she'll also go over some really cool facts about bay scallops in general. Then I will go over some recommendations regarding how to safely scallop while you're out on the water. And Dr. Farzad, our ex seafood extension specialist with Florida Sea Grant, will discuss food safety aspects when we are cleaning and cooking those harvested scallops. Then Dr. Savannah Berry, who is a regional extension agent with Florida Sea Grant, will teach us all about seagrass safe boating and why it's important. And then we will have our FWC Law Enforcement Officer Specialist Bryce Falupier go over recreational harvest rules in boating and dive flag safety. And then we have Captain Catherine Spratt, who is a Florida-friendly fishing guide out of Citrus County, and she's here to share some recommendations on how marine businesses, such as charter guides, can incorporate some additional safety measures during the pandemic. And then we will end with a short poll and proceed into our question and answer session. And I do wanna note that we have all of the microphones muted. So if you have a question during the talk, please type it into the question and answer area, and we will address all of the questions at the end of our webinar. And we will also share some additional resources for everyone um, at the end on the last slide, as well as through the question and answer session. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Greneman with FWC. Good evening, everyone, and thank you, Brittany, for inviting me on this panel. I'm the uh, lead biologist for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Research Institute State Scallop Program. And as Brittany mentioned, today I'll be talking about uh, the biology of scallops and the recreational fishery. Next slide. Okay, the bay scallop, Argopectin irradiens, is a bivalve, which means that it has two valves or shells. The upper shell is a dark color and the lower shell is typically white, although you will see yellow and orange color morphs out there. And one of the first things you'll probably notice about bay scallops are their um, bright blue eyes, which are along the rim of the shell. They can have 40 or more of these blue eyes along their shells and the eyes help them to detect movement and predators. Another thing you'll quickly notice if you go scalloping is that scallops will swim away from you if they detect you using those uh, blue eyes that I mentioned. They do this by clapping their shells together rapidly. Uh, can you press the next? There you go. <clears throat> so this makes it a little bit more fun and exciting to collect them out in the field. Next. This is what a scallop looks like when you open it. They're hermaphrodites, which means that they contain both male and female reproductive organs. They can reach a maximum shell height of around three and a half inches, but most of the scallops that you find in Florida generally aren't larger than two and a half to three inches in shell height. And unlike other shellfish like oysters and clams, the only part of the scallop that most people eat is the adductor muscle. Next, please. Okay, scallops are broadcast spawners. That means that they release sperm and eggs in the water where the eggs are then fertilized. In Florida, most spawning occurs in the fall when the temperature drops. And it takes about 36 hours for fertilized eggs to develop into larvae. Larval scallops are pelagic, and that means that they drift in the water column. On average, they usually drift for about 10 to 14 days. And while drifting, the larvae develop into juvenile scallops, which we call spat, and they attach to seagrass blades when they're about one millimeter in size. Now, about 90% of the spat will die within six weeks of settling, and those that survive eventually detach from the seagrass and fall to the bottom. 
And generally, most scallops will die after they spawn. So in Florida, they typically only live for between one to two years. Next. Scallops are filter feeders, which means that they open their shells and feed on particles of decayed plant matter and phytoplankton that they trap. In comparison, they have many predators, including octopus, snails, rays, crabs, and us. And we are definitely not the only ones that love to eat scallops. They have two defense mechanisms to protect them from predation. One are their shells, which they clamp tightly shut and which can be fairly well camouflaged in some cases, although other times their camouflage is not that great. If you uh, proceed to the next picture. <clears throat> their other defense mechanism is to swim away, which I showed you earlier. Next. Bay scallops attach to seagrass blades when they settle. So seagrass is very important for this species, which Dr. Barry will be talking about later. And because scallops uh, filter feed and use their gills to absorb oxygen from the water, scallops need good water quality in order to survive. Next. For scallops, good water quality is between 20 to 35 parts per thousand um, in salinity. And in addition, scallops can tolerate temperatures anywhere from about 50 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, although their preferred temperature is closer to 70 degrees. There are a number of threats to scallops, including red tide blooms, pollution, large rainfall events, um, which can cause lots of sediment to get in the water, which we refer to as tur turbidity. And so all of these can negatively impact scallop populations. Next. We conduct surveys to measure the density of scallops at sites where, where, where we've been working to restore scallops. Next. We swim 100 meter transects at stations that are randomly selected in the bay within the numbered grid boxes, as you can see in the map of St. Joe Bay on the right. And in these transects, we count the number of scallops that we encounter and we measure the shell heights of these scallops. Next. In the past, we've also conducted these surveys throughout the areas open to scalloping prior to the season opening. For instance, uh, this graph here shows the data from the pre-season surveys from 2012 through 2019 throughout the open areas. Um, but this year, we're switching to conducting surveys after the scallop season closes instead of prior to the opening of the scallop season. And one of the reasons we're doing this is because scallops spawn in the fall, typically after the scallop season closes each year. So by sampling in the fall, we can evaluate the scallops that are available to spawn, which directly supports the fishery the following season. The data that we collect in the fall can then show us larger overall trends that indicate changes in spawning stock and would be useful in assessing the overall health of the population across its range. Next. All right, uh, this year there are four main zones that each have different season start and end dates. The um, Citrus and Hernando region is open from July 1st to uh, September 24th, and it includes all state waters south of Alligator Pass, Day Beacon Number 4 near the mouth of the Suwannee River in the Levy County and north of the Hernando Pasco County line. So this region includes Cedar Key, Crystal River, and Homosassa. Now I just wanted to mention that one thing that we ask is that you don't discard uh, scallop shells in inshore waters used for recreational activities because these piles of shells can create hazards for swimmers and damage seagrass habitat. So we ask instead that you discard these shells in the trash or you can choose to bring them home with you. Next. Um, the FWC law enforcement is going to go over all of the rules and regulations for the fishery, but I just wanted to take a moment to clarify the gallon limits for bay scallops because I see a lot of confusion about this when I'm interacting with scallopers. So for most five gallon buckets, like the kind you get from Home Depot, which you can see here, 
the five gallon mark is actually not to the very top of the bucket, but it's closer to the bucket handle. So in this picture, these scallopers would have collected more than their 10 gallon limit. You can buy some five gallon buckets that have marks indicating the volume of each gallon in the bucket. But if your bucket doesn't have this, I recommend taking a gallon jug, filling it with water, and then dumping the gallon in your bucket to create a line where the five gallon line is on your bucket. But don't just assume that the five gallon limit is to the top of your bucket. Next. If you wanna help us monitor the recreational harvest of bay scallops, which is very helpful, and I hope you do wanna help us with that, you can complete an online survey that will ask you questions about how many scallops you harvested, where you harvested the scallops from, et cetera. Um, you can see some of the questions on the right-hand side of the screen there. And you can access this survey through the FWC Reporter app by clicking on the Scallop Harvest Survey option or by going to the website shown here through SurveyMonkey. Uh, next. And we appreciate any information you can provide us because that really helps us to evaluate the recreational scallop harvest. Next. So with that, I want to thank you for your time and I wish you good luck in your scalloping and we're going to be waiting on questions until the end. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Now on to some scalloping um, best practices. Again, my name is Brittany Scharf and I'm the Marine Agent in Hernando County with UFI Fist Extension and the Florida Sea Grant Program. But before we dive any further, I know each year during our in-person seminars, we always have a few folks that uh, have never gone scalloping before and they're considered trying it this summer, but they're unsure of how to do it or what they even need. So some things to consider when you're making your shopping list or packing up or your boat, you're gonna need a mask and snorkel to help you see the scallops underwater. Fins are always nice, especially if the current in the area is strong or just to help you dive under the water and be able to grab those scallops. Um, a mesh bag that cinches shut for you to place your scallops in when you do find them. Uh, the cinching part is probably the most important because like you just saw in Jen's video a few minutes ago, the scallops do swim and they will swim out of your bag if you don't keep it closed. Most places you're gonna need a boat to be able to access the seagrass areas where the scallops like to hide out. And you will need a diver's down flag and a license. These are required components of scalloping and Officer Felipe will cover those details later on in the webinar. Some additional equipment that people also like to use are scuba gear, um, little hand nets to grab the scallops while they swim, and sometimes gloves. And a quick clip of what it looks like when you're searching for those scallops that are hiding out underwater. So as you can see here, they, they hide out pretty well in those seagrass beds. Now before you go out on the water, it's important to develop a safety plan. Unfortunately, accidents can easily happen when you're out there. So it's important to implement safety measures. Um, in Florida Sea Grant, we like to call those our scalloping best practices. Before you even launch, you need to make sure someone on land knows where you're gonna be. So leave a float plan with them um, let them know where you plan to launch, what time you plan to be back, some information about your boat, details like that. Um, that way, if something does happen, they're able to call officials and let them know. Also, make sure everybody on the boat knows where things like your fresh drinking water is, sun protection, um, where you store your first aid kit, where the life vests are, uh, where that fire extinguisher might be located, and where any other safety equipment on your boat is stored. I know we're in a little bit of a dry spell right now, but while you're out there, beware of approaching storms. Thunderstorms are common during Florida summer's months, especially in our afternoons.
So it's a good plan to start your day at the farthest site from your launch point and then work your way back to your starting point as you get further and further into the afternoon when those storms are going to be more likely to develop. Sometimes storms do approach quickly. Um, there might not be any time to escape. So make sure all your passengers on board know what to do if you're forced to wait out the storm or if your vessel does unfortunately get struck by lightning. Always have an observer on your boat while others are in the water scalloping. I can't tell you how many times I've seen the anchor not hold and that boat just start floating away. So if everybody's in the water and they have their heads down, they're looking for scallops and your anchor isn't holding, you might not even know that your boat is uh, floating away till you try to swim back to it and it's not there anymore. Also, having that person on board can help somebody if they're in the water and they need assistance, especially when your tides change. When that water floods that shallow seagrass flat during those changing tides, currents can become really strong and then it makes it difficult for your swimmers to get back to the boat. Um, and it's also good to consider snorkeling with a buddy as well because you can help each other out when you're in the water. In Florida Sea Grant, we recommend that you harvest scallops that are an inch and a half or larger and then return anything that is smaller back into the water alive. Uh, just like we learned in Jen's talk, this is because those scallops only live for a year, two years at best, and this gives those smaller ones a chance to reproduce when the temperature changes in the fall, which, like she noted, which is after our recreational scalloping season. So then these small scallops can help contribute to next year's scallops population. And last but not least, uh, Jen also mentioned when you're harvesting and cleaning your scallops, it's important to be aware of where you are dumping these pieces. Um, she requested to please not discard them in state waters. Um, if you throw them in channels, then it's going to cost money later on to dredge it out. Um, throwing the guts and shells in areas that doesn't flush well, when the stuff starts to degrade um, and, and um, start to decay, um, you're going to degrade that water quality, you're going to lead to bacteria and algae issues. Um, when you're dumping those shells in shallow swimming areas, um, it's going to harm the swimmers when they step on those sharp edges. So be mindful of where you decide to dispose of these pieces and the best place is to bring them back and dispose of them in a trash can. Which then leads us to our food safety portion of the webinar. So I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Farzad, our seafood extension specialist with the University of Florida and our Florida Sea Grant program. Uh, thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Razia Farzad and today I will talk about some simple steps that you can follow to make sure that the scallops are safe to eat. Next slide, please. So uh, to make sure a scallop is a safe seafood, uh, we should uh, follow some strategies to control the pathogens or eliminate the pathogen and biotoxin. And that includes practicing personal hygiene, proper shocking and cleaning practices, and following storing and cooking recommendations that are out there. Next, please. Uh, one of the easiest, most effective way to control foodborne pathogen is maintaining your personal hygiene. So before handling a scallop or cleaning a scallop, make sure that you are washing your hand and make sure that you are uh, following proper hand washing technique. Basically, you should wet your hand with warm water, lather it with soap, and for at least 20 seconds, scrub your hands together. Make sure that you're cleaning between your fingers, under the nails, your thumb, and the wrists. Also, you need to make sure that all the utensils and cleaning tools that you are using for handling the scallop is clean and sanitized, which means wash with soap and detergent. Something related to current pandemic, if you are uh, handling the scallop with people that are not living with you in the same place, I highly recommend to wear the personal protective equipment or PPE, specifically mask that is recommended by WHO and CDC to make sure that you and your family are safe. Next slide, please. Um, uh, other strategies to control pathogen and also minimize the risk of biotoxin 
Usually, as Jen said, scallops are a field cell feeder, so they can accumulate bacteria, viruses, or biotoxin. So the main thing is that you shouldn't uh, consume them raw. But as soon as you co uh, collect the scallop, you should, the control, you should control the temperature. You should, uh, the, you should keep them an, at eye, on ice at 40 degree Fahrenheit for your trip to the shore. But temperature cannot control biotoxin. But the good news is that biotoxin only accumulate in the gut area not the adductor muscle that we usually consume. So if you effectively shock or clean the scallop, you are safe in regard to a uh, biotoxin problem. I'll talk about the uh, uh, cleaning steps in next slides, but basically you need to make sure that there is no traces of gut loop around the adductor muscle. You should wash the muscle and make sure that there is no cross content between the gut content that an edible portion of the scallop. Next slide, please. Here is a, some step that you can follow to clean your scallop. As Jen said, the scallop has lighter and darker shell. So to clean the scallop, you can use a butter knife or a spoon, make sure that it's clean and washed with detergent. Locate the dark shell and place it upward. Open the shell using your knife and detach the muscle from the upper shell and uh, dispose the darker, shuttle, uh, darker shelf in a bucket that you have, not in the state water, as the previous uh, people mentioned that. Uh, carefully pull all the dark muscle and all the soft tissue around the white adductor muscle that you want to consume by gently scraping from, from the hinge to the front with knife or a spoon and uh, gently uh, take away the adductor muscle that you want to consume. Next slide, please. For a storing, uh, you should keep the muscle that you collected at 40 degree Fahrenheit at home at refrigerator until you are ready to use. You can use the fresh scallop up to two days, but we usually recommend that you consume it within one day. Do not store your scallops in the water. If you want to have a extended, extended shelf life, you can keep them in the freezer at zero degree Fahrenheit or lower for up to three months. You can put the scallop in the airtight container and put it in the freezer. And to thaw, or fr uh, to thaw your frozen scallop, you should put it in the freezer a day ahead of the time. And if you cook the scallop and you don't want to consume it right away, make sure that if it's at 90 degree Fahrenheit, you have to consume it within, uh, within one hour. If the temperature is on less than 90 degree Fahrenheit, you have up to two hours to consume the scallop. Next slide, please. There are some cooking recommendations for different types of proteins that uh, you should uh, measure the internal temperature when you are cooking any proteins. There is no internal temperature measurement recommendation by FDA for scallops. You should just look at the changing color. So when the color is milky white or opaque, it means that scallop is ready. It usually takes three to, four three to five minutes to see the color change. So basically by following uh, some basic rule, maintaining your personal hygiene, keeping the scallop at 40 degree Fahrenheit and um, following all the safety rules, you, need to, you can make sure that the scallop is safe to eat. And next slide, enjoy your scallop. Thank you. And then uh, next up, we have Dr. Barry teaching us about the seagrass ecosystems that these bay scallops like to hide out in and how we can protect these environments. All right, wonderful. Thanks so much, Brittany. And thank you, everybody, for being here this evening. And um, next slide, Brittany. So as everyone's been hinting at leading up to this point, this is really what we're after. Uh, we love to see this lush seagrass meadow um, with these little Easter eggs that we like to call scallops nestled in between them. And I've spent most of my time in graduate school focusing on all that green stuff around those Easter eggs that all of you are probably more interested in. 
Um, but most folks have already alluded to this several times throughout the talk already, but the seagrass is actually really vital for the bay scallops. And next slide. Just a little bit about seagrass itself. Um, they actually live fully submerged in salt water. Um, they're not the marsh grasses that you see emerging like when you're on your way out the river, the grasses that are growing above the water. These are those grasses that are completely submerged out on the flats. And they're actually flowering plants. There's a little close up there you can see of a turtle grass flower there on the bottom right. And um, they have a fully developed root and rhizome system, which is different from a lot of the macroalgae and other fleshy plants that we see out in our estuarine areas. And um, they require really good water quality, and that means plenty of light. So scallops like uh, water quality that's of a certain salinity and that has low silt loads and things like that. And seagrasses and scallops happen to co-occur because they like similar types of water quality. Um, okay, next slide. Uh, so as we've mentioned, uh, scallops or seagrasses provide lots of ecological functions. So most people intuitively understand that they provide habitat and a foraging area for many different species. And you can see there a close up of a little baby spat that's still attached there to the seagrass blades. Um, but seagrasses do a lot of other great things for us in addition to providing habitat. They actually make the water nicer for us to swim in when we're searching for scallops by increasing the water clarity. They trap and stabilize sediments and they do a really good job at that. So they're making the water quality better for us to swim in, but they're also helping keep those silt loads down, which is why scallops like to hang out in seagrass flats even as adults. Um, Seagrasses also do other great things like trap a lot of carbon and put a lot of oxygen back into the water for all of those critters to breathe. And beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but I find seagrass flats to be quite beautiful and they add a lot of recreational value to our um, coastal areas. Next slide. Okay, so we are very blessed in Florida that we have a lot of seagrass. We actually have the two largest seagrass meadows in North America, and the largest one is down in Florida Bay uh, and around in the Keys area, but I know that I'm biased, but I believe that the best seagrass meadow in Florida is up here in the Big Bend and the Nature Coast because our seagrass meadows have scallops living in them. Next slide. But unfortunately in Florida, even though we have a lot of seagrass, we also have a lot of threats to our seagrass meadows. And we are losing seagrass in a lot of areas of the state. And in fact, globally, seagrasses are one of the most threatened coastal habitats. The leading cause of this loss is degraded water quality and decline in light levels. So anything that blocks light or um, smothers out the blades like siltation or nutrient enrichment that leads to algal blooms is going to reduce light for seagrasses. Of course, they're stuck on the bottom. And so uh, that's, that's unfortunately the biggest cause of seagrass decline. But there is another major one that's definitely up, up there in Florida. And that is physical damage through prop scars and anchor drags and things like that. And that's the picture that you're looking at on the lower right, which is unfortunately an all too familiar sight in, in our shallow grass flats in the, throughout Florida, but in the Big Bend as well. There are other threats, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to cover them here. Next. So let's take a closer look at what seagrass scarring means to us here in Florida. Um, so this is a screen capture that I took from Google Earth and it's a little bit hard to see depending on the settings on your screen and the resolution. So if you go to the next slide, Brittany, you'll see that I've traced out here all of the scars in this area. And it's only a nine acre area, which isn't that large of, a, of an area. And in just this small, Area. And this is off Taylor County, which isn't even a very populous area of Florida. We have almost 2,600 linear feet of scars. And this is a big problem because it's costly if we want to go in and restore these seagrass scars. Um, so just for this one small area, it could be up to 40,000. And if you consider a conservative estimate of all of the scarred acres in Florida, we could be talking billions of dollars to restore all of this seagrass. And I just think it's interesting there, that scar that I've traced in red, it was actually captured in real time by Google Earth. Um, you can see a boat creating a scar there. 
Um, so of course, this is a big financial burden. There's no way that we ever would go in and pay to restore every single scar, but it's just interesting to think about how this adds up and every little piece of that seagrass that we've lost is uh, translates into losing some of those services that we talked about. Next. So um, in addition to the potential financial cost and the loss of those services, there are lots of other reasons why we should give a little extra thought to seagrasses by being seagrass safe boaters. And the first is that scars usually take at least a year, usually longer than that, to heal, if they even heal at all. So seagrass is actually not very closely related to the grass that's in your lawn. Their, their closest land-based relative are lilies, and they really don't like to be mowed, um, and they especially don't like to be mowed if it impacts their root systems. And so the, the seagrasses don't grow back as quickly as most people think they do. Um, and then all those scars sort of crisscrossing through the grass flats actually make them more resilient to being lost, uh, or less resilient to being lost, sorry. So if a storm or a hurricane comes through, um, it can actually get under the root mat of the seagrasses and peel up large sections in heavily scarred seagrass meadows. And this has been documented in um, er several areas in Florida. Uh, scars also degrade habitat quality. They increase the success rate of predators that like to patrol along those edges that are created, those artificial edges that are created in what would otherwise be a continuous habitat. And so I guess it depends on uh, what perspective. If you're the predator, then you may say that it increases your habitat quality, but for all of the little critters that are trying to hide in the seagrass, it makes that a little bit harder for them to do. Um, and in addition to all of that stuff, um, scarring seagrass actually harms your boating equipment and can lead to costly repairs to you. It can bend your prop. It can um, send bad stuff into your intake that you don't want, um, damage your skeg, or worse. So uh, scarring seagrass is costly to you personally, or it can be. And then also, again, it's a matter of opinion, but I happen to find scars to be kind of an unsightly reminder of all the negative human impacts we have. It's just kind of a bummer when you're out on the flats and you just see scars everywhere. Next. So how can we be seagrass safe? So the first one is to just avoid seagrass when possible. Use mark channels um, and basically stay in, out in deeper water when you're on plane to the extent possible. And then also plan your trip around the tides so that um, you can avoid boating during the shallowest times of the day, or at least you can know when you need to start heading out off of the grass flats. Uh, Brittany mentioned the changing of the tides being a potential safety issue for swimmers, but it can also be an issue for you as a boater because you can find yourself high and dry because a lot of our seagrass areas in the uh, nature coast are quite shallow and can even be exposed on certain tides and wind direction combinations. So if you do need to boat over seagrass, which of course you eventually will if you're gonna go scalloping, you should slow down and trim up or even use your trolling motor if you're, if you're over shallow seagrass and look for signs like churning up of mud or the, if you see some leaves getting chopped off the top of the seagrass, that's a surefire indicator that you're getting into territory that's too shallow for your boat to operate at the current speed or depth. So that's kind of the danger zone. We call that prop wash. And if you see that, then you need to either trim up, slow down, or potentially even change course because you're getting too shallow. And then finally, if for some reason you do find yourself aground on a seagrass flat, the best thing to do is to turn off your motor, put on a pair of shoes or something to protect your feet, lift your motor out, and push your boat back to deeper water. If you attempt to motor off, not only will that potentially damage your motor, um, and waste a lot of gas. <laughs> it will also cause an injury to the seagrass area that's even worse than a scar. It's called a blowout, and it's basically um, when the exhaust and uh, force of your propeller causes a really deep hole, again called a blowout in the seagrass, and that can never recover naturally, and that requires a lot more costly repairs, um, and, and it's a really bad injury to create in seagrass. So uh, definitely do not power off if you find yourself aground on seagrass. Next. All right, um, and then lastly, just a, one thing to mention here is that seagrass is also highly protected within aquatic preserves. And as of today, 
all of the waters that we're talking about today for, uh, are within an aquatic preserve area. I don't know if, if everyone on here saw the news that the new Nature Coast Aquatic Preserve was signed by the governor today. And of course, there's the Big Bend Seagrasses Aquatic Preserve and the St. Martin's Marsh Aquatic Preserve are all protecting the seagrass meadows in this area and damaging seagrass within these areas can carry a fine of up to a thousand dollars. So if you don't care about anything else I said, maybe you can think about seagrasses and seagrass protection in that way. Last slide. Yeah, so this is my last slide here and I just wanted to point out that there are some actions you can take. Um, I'll share a link to a, a seagrass safe boating pledge that you can take. It might seem silly, but actually research shows that if you take a pledge, it, it really will cause you to think a little bit more about that action when it comes time to apply it. So maybe you guys are going scalloping tomorrow and you want to think twice about the seagrass before you do it. Uh, but if you want to protect seagrasses, the, uh, the other ways that you can do so are just to take actions that protect water quality. Um, if you're on septic, make sure that it's well maintained. Um, hook up to sewer if you have that option available, or you can install fr Florida friendly landscaping, rain gardens, and just make sure that you are aware of um, policies locally that can be implemented to protect water quality because at the end of the day if we protect water quality we're going to be protecting seagrass and that was all I had for you guys on seagrass and I hope you guys will uh, type some questions in the Q&A because it's something I'm very passionate about. Thanks Savannah. So with that I am going to um, unmute our law enforcement. So Officer Bryce, you should be able to talk. Um, he's going to share with us some scallop regulations, boating, and dive flag safety. Thank you. Yes, uh, I'm Officer Bryce Phillippe. I'm a public information officer for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission Division of Law Enforcement. Uh, just so everyone is aware, I do not have Zoom, so I will not be able to see the screen that uh, you all are looking at. Uh, to get us started, the recreational base scallop season uh, for Levy, Citrus, and Hernando counties, uh, it's open July 1st and will remain open through September 24th. The direct and continuous transit of uh, legally harvested base scallops is allowed through closed areas. Uh, big thing is boaters may not stop their vessels in the waters that are closed to harvest. And you must pr uh, proceed directly to the dock or ramp to land the scallops in the closed areas. So you can't stop if you're going to be transiting through a closed area. <clears throat> um, any individual participating in harvest of scallops will need a saltwater fishing license unless that individual is otherwise exempt from a saltwater fishing license. Like uh, an example be a Florida resident over the age of 65 or um, a child under the age of uh, 16 for you to be exempt. Um, let's see here. Uh, scallops can be harvested either by hand or dip net. The recreational, and the keyword here is individual daily bag limit for scallops is two gallons whole scallops or one pint um, scallop meat. The maximum recreational, and the keyword here is vessel daily bag limit uh, for scallops is 10 gallons whole scallops or half a gallon scallop meat. Um, just depends if you're an individual or in the vessel. <clears throat> um, coming to up to like dive flags, when an individual is wholly or partially submerged, they're using a face mask and a snorkel or underwater breathing apparatus, you're gonna need a diver's down device. This can be a flag, a buoy, or another device that'll meet the requirements. Uh, if you're using a flag, remember to put it from the highest point uh, where it can be seen from 360 degrees. So if you're on the boat, um, make sure it's up high enough that it's not being blocked by your center console, a motor, or T-top, bimini, anything like that. It needs to be from the very highest point. When you're uh, snorkeling or diving, um, with that dive flag up, you need to stay within 300 feet of your device in open water, or if you're in a river, canal, or inlet, uh, you need to be within 100 feet. Boats should make every effort to stay outside of these boundaries, these same boundaries, when they see a diver's uh, down flag displayed. However, if they do approach, they need to be uh, going at idle speed when they're within that 300 feet in open water or within 100 feet in a river, inlet, or channel. Uh, when your last snorkel, uh, snorkel or diver is out of the water, you must take that diver's down uh, device down. 
Uh, you can't have it up when there's no divers in the water. So as soon as that last person is out of the water, uh, if you're going up to eat lunch or take a break or shuck your scallops, whatever, as soon as that last person is out of the water, that diver's down flag needs to come down. Um, when you're traveling from location to location, if you're going from one place and scalloping is not very good and you decide to go to another place, um, make sure that diver's down flag is down and wear, PD, uh, wear your life jackets when you're traveling from location to location. Uh, make sure you're constantly scanning around, especially looking out for other diver down devices. Um, that'll show where divers or snorkelers are in the water. A uh, couple things, uh, before you get started on your trip, make sure you check the weather. Uh, weather conditions can change rapidly on the water. And uh, while you're on the water, keep an eye on the horizon for any unexpected storms that may blow in. Before getting out on the water, check your safety equipment. Know where it is, look, know where it's located before an emergency arises. Uh, this is going to include your life jackets, whistles or a horn, your lights, fire extinguisher, and flares. Um, operating a boat while impaired by alcohol or drugs is dangerous and illegal. Our FWC officers will be looking for impaired operators. These operators will face arrest if found to be operating under the influence of alcohol or drugs. So before you leave the dock, make sure you designate a sober operator. Filing the float plan, I heard this uh, a little while ago, it's definitely a good idea um, to let family and friends know where you're going um, and when you plan on the return. The sooner the rescuers can uh, get on the water and to the location where the overdue boater said uh, where they said they were going to go, the more likely the outcome will be positive. Um, if anyone has any more uh, questions or wants a little more information about boating safety, you can visit our website at myfwc.com forward slash boating. Again, that's myfwc.com forward slash boating. Thank you. Thank you, Officer Bryce. Excellent. Well, it's Savannah again, everybody, and I'm just really happy to welcome Captain Kate Spratt here to talk to you all. Um, she is a guide in Citrus County and um, she's been in the county for over 10 years and she has lots of experience with scallop seasons over the years. She's also a member of the Homosassa Guides Association and a newly certified Florida Friendly Fishing Guide and she's also a great photographer so you guys are in for a treat on her slides because she has some awesome photos to share with you all as well as the information she's going to cover. Thank you so much, Savannah. I appreciate the intro. Um, first, I want to thank everyone for joining in on this uh, webinar. Scallop season is very close to my heart. It's one of the reasons I became a captain uh, seven years ago was I went scalloping and I enjoyed the experience so much that I wanted to share it with others. Um, so scalloping from a captain's perspective is a tremendous opportunity to um, be able to educate and and, and share our, our environment with our clients. Um, and there are some precautions that we need to take. We've got a, changes that are coming about with the coronavirus and the, those changes are going to impact how we do things, but not why we do it. So I've got a few different tips to go with for, um, for guides, if you are a guide, but many of these practices and tips can also go for the recreational boater or scalloper as well. So we'll go ahead and get started with that. Next slide, please. And so the first are going to be your general practices. Um, as a captain, it is a best practice to go ahead and book a family group, avoid filling seats. For example, if you have a six person maximum on your, on your vessel and you would normally Go with, with one family group. This helps to reduce the uh, cross-contamination between the family groups and reduce their exposure. Um, this is also best for the resource because you can you book only one trip daily. Um, again, it prevents the cross-contamination and it gives the, you as the captain plenty of time to sanitize your boat and your equipment correctly. Not to mention you're taking a smaller number of clients out to the resource, which ultimately we're all here to protect, to provide um, this enjoyment in perpetuity for, uh, for our clients. Include your safety policy in your pre-trip information and again during your safety briefing. Um, I make a very, as a, as a captain and a guide, I make a very clear in the beginning of my trips what the safety expectations are, where 
all the safety items are on my vessel and this year be adding in what co uh, coronavirus practices I will have. One of those is to offer clients hand sanitizer upon entering and exiting your vessel. This just gives another added opportunity to get that, um, that sanitation in there. And if you're the client and you're unsure if your captain's going to have this, this offered for you, go ahead and bring your own. Um, and if you'd feel more comfortable wearing a mask or gloves, that is up to you. As a previous presenter said that you're going to be in close quarters on boats by all means if you're unable to social distance properly uh, do so with a mask that's the best practice at this time um, as a captain try to maintain a safe distance but the nature of fishing and scalloping and being on a boat is to be in close quarters cover your face when a safe distance cannot be man maintained many of us are already having a um a buff or net gator style uh on our neck so that can uh, stand in as a face mask as needed. Um, finally, provide garbage disposal for your clients. A lot of the times we see these hand sanitizer, the towelettes or masks or gloves. It's You're on a boat, it's very easy for those items to blow away. So you could dispose of them in an item such as the ca caddy can, which is one of the sponsors of the Florida Friend Lake Fishing Guide program. It's a really neat uh, can that attaches to your vessel and you it uh, prevents all of your garbage from blowing away. Next slide, please. Sanitizing your equipment. This is a big one because you have, as a, as a captain, you've got many clients coming on and off your boat. Up to, for, uh, for me, it's up to six a day. We've got rental equipment, some visitor or clients bring their own. Being able to sanitize it properly not only protects your clients, but it also protects you as well because they may bring something in that you don't already have. There's different products available on the market, different name brand products, but the, the main ones are gonna be your quaternary ammonium and bleach. Quaternary ammonium is one of the most effective for killing viruses. However, it is also one of the harshest for the environment. Again, we're all here as environmental advocates and stewards. So uh, quaternary ammonium may not be the best choice for washing your boat or your equipment if you don't have the proper way to dispose of it. Steramine is the brand name for a quaternary ammonium that has been used for a long time in the diving industry to sanitize rebreathers, um, different regulators, and equipment that has soft rubber that can be adversely affected by harsher chemicals. However, it is not on the EPA's end list and therefore um, it is not recommended for that. Uh, purpose to completely uh, prevent the transmission of the coronavirus. And as always, follow all the product directions. Make sure that you are mixing it to the right percentage, that you are leaving it on for the proper amount of time uh, as per the product label. Bleach is the most cost effective and readily available of the sanitizers. Uh, CDC recommends a 2% solution, which the easiest math on that is a third of a cup of bleach per gallon of water. The key there is that it needs to be cool water. When you use warm water with bleach, it actually starts to deactivate the, uh, the chemical compound, and so you need to do that into cool water. Contact time, it's fabulous. It's only one minute. So if you have a, uh, a Tupperware or a large tub and you can put all of your scalloping equipment in there and have your bleach solution and let it soak for over a minute, you should be good to go. One of the other things is, of course, soap and water. The downside with soap is that you actually have physical or mechanical uh, agitation of the, the items that you're washing. If not, then it doesn't reach the full efficacy of it. So um, the recommendation is to use the bleach to sanitize and the soap and water to remove any of leftover sunscreen or other harsh solids that may be on that uh, equipment surface. Again, all of these practices are applicable as well uh, to the, um, the recreational scalloper. Next slide, please. We also have sanitizing your vessel. Um, as a captain, of course, we are touching everything all the time and being able to identify the transmission points 
of like the gunnels, the chairs, railings, or, or wherever your clients or yourself are touching frequently is the first step to being able to properly sanitize your vessel. Again, using a chemical compound such as Lysol or Clorox wipes, both of those are that quaternary ammonium. Again, not the best for the environment, but in the wipe form, you are preventing it from going into the water and you're able to let it air dry at that point. Another one, again, is the bleach solution to wash your boat. Just a reminder that bleach can adversely affect uh, aluminum and stainless steel, and it can be a very caustic agent. So it does need to be rinsed off, and it can be an environmental contam contaminant. So be aware of where your bleach is going and how you're disposing of that. Um, one other thing for when you're out on a charter is payment of your captain. I, you know, we all want to get paid for, paid for our business and cash is always king in this industry. However, at this point in time, some of the best choices are other than cash. Um, bring them a check, know ahead of time what your, what your captain is expecting for payment. Um, and electronic payments are always acceptable too, such as PayPal or Venmo. Um, services like PayPal do charge a fee to the captain, depending on how you send them the money. So just be aware of that. Um, Venmo, I do not believe, charges any of those. So if you have any questions about scalloping um, uh, practices to, to keep yourself safe and your clients safe, feel free to ask a question in that Q&A, and I'll do my best to respond. Thank you so much. Thank you, Captain Kate. All right, this brings us to our poll. So um, you should see a box in a few short seconds that has some questions. And we ask that you take a few moments to answer these questions. And once everyone has their answers in, we will jump right into the chat box to begin our question and answer session. All right, I see votes still coming in, so we'll keep it up for just a couple more seconds. All right, thank you for participating in our poll. Here are some resources that were covered during this talk if you would like to go uh, and check them out for more information. And I am going to hand it over to Rhett to start our question and answer session. So Rhett is our communications um, manager within Florida Sea Grant. Thanks, Brittany. So we've had a few questions come through with some similar topics. The first one I'll pitch to Captain Spratt, and uh, there was a question about scouting reports for this year. Does it look like it's going to be a strong year for scallops in the, sea, in the region? We've done some scouting here outside of Citrus County, um, and it depends. They're, they're there. They're not as thick as they have been historically in in years past but they are there and again it's all about the experience um, getting out there and and seeing the scallops and seeing what lives in all the seagrass and the different reef atmosphere um, is a big part of the scallop being experience um, some some people have found them in deeper water some people have found them in shallower so with with the season opening tomorrow we'll probably get more accurate uh, representation of what um, uh, of what the reports are looking like Great, thank you. Uh, the next one's for Dr. Granham, and, and there were a couple of comments about last season being a little off or lower. And is there, can you tell us, is there any reason for that or, or is that just a, a natural cycle? Yes, uh, thank you for that question. You may have seen on the graph that I showed in the presentation that scallop densities were a bit lower last year in many of the regions that we surveyed than they have been in past years. But um, as you mentioned, Rhett, <clears throat> scallop population abundance is highly variable because 
scallops live for only one year and they're very sensitive to changes in water quality like salinity. <clears throat> and one thing we know is that in many areas last year the and the year before, we had a uh, higher than average rainfall, which has a tendency to negatively affect scallops um, because they're very sensitive to changes in the salinity and turbidity. Rainfall can um, increase the uh, silt or tur turbidity in a region, which can negatively affect scallop abundance as well. Thank you for answering that. Um, the last question then that we've got on our list right now is just any suggestions for ways of recycling shells? I mean, we, we mentioned that it can be thrown away, but is there a way to recycle them? This is Brittany. I know I've seen um, some people actually use them in their yard instead of mulch. They've used the shells uh, around their plants or even in their driveway. I don't know if anybody else has some ideas. Yeah, the driveway thing, this is Savannah, I've used that before. Um, and then there are also some instances where they can be mixed with oyster shell and used in restoration projects. It's a little bit harder to find an avenue for that, but we've done that some in Cedar Key and had some pretty good success with it. This is Captain Kate. I've used them in place of mulch in my potted plants, such as potted citrus, um, to help keep the moisture into the pots versus using regular uh, wood mulch. All right, well, thank you. That's it for the questions, Brittany. But we one more. We had one. Yeah, I'm sorry. I see one more coming in on the on the chat. Um, it just says, um, I think this may have been covered, but we should uh, put the scallops straight into the cooler from the water, right? Do not put them in a bucket on the deck. Uh, Dr. Yes. Farza, could you yes. answer that? Uh, Razia yes, speaking. Yes, you yes. should put them in the cooler. There should be a ice. Make sure that there is a hole in the cooler. So as ice is melting, it drains the water. And we also recommend to dump a towel and put it in between the ice and the scallop because it's kind of like a temper the, uh, temperature shock and keep the scallop a little while longer, uh, alive longer. We don't care about keeping the scallop alive, but that kind of helps to reduce the increase in the number of the pathogen. Thank you. Sure. All right. Well, thank you everyone for that joined us for our virtual scalloping seminar this year. And I'd also like to thank all of my presenters who helped with this virtual presentation. Um, we hope that you learned a lot and enjoy your time out there on the water safely scalloping this season and have a great rest of your night.